Hello, Antioch Baptist Church and friends. I'd like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. Before we get started, we'd like to thank Brother Jimmy for taking the Sunday School lesson last week. We, it's a blessing and I appreciate him being willing to do that. And you know, it was nice to have a, have a week off after 40 plus weeks of doing the Sunday School lesson straight in a row. So, and if we continue on this way, maybe we'll get some others to take a turn and going forward. Uh, but before we get into the lesson, as we continue studying about the life of Joseph here, as we finish up the book of Genesis over the next few weeks, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go into the lesson. Dear Lord, just want to thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you for this day you allowed us to live. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your protection and, and guidance and each and every day, we pray you just be with each each one that's sick. We pray for especially those battling the the virus and cancer and other things that are so prevalent today. We pray you just be with each missionary working and laboring for you. I know it's a difficult time for them to work and labor, but we pray that you'd continue to give them souls for their labor. We pray you'd be with our church. They would stay strong and unified for you. We pray you'd bless Brother Daniel as he preaches from time to time, and pray that you know. That just give him an unction and a liberty to preach the word that you've laid upon his heart. We just pray he'd be in the service tomorrow if the weather allows us to have it. And just pray that, that this winter weather pattern would end soon, that we'd be able to definitely not have to worry about the weather and keeping us out of the house of God. Lord, we pray it be with just lead God and direct us in all things. We pray for our nation, that we could see a measure of revival in this nation, that we'd see our leaders turn and look to you for leadership and guidance. And just to, if we'd see you know, a return to looking to you, and it seems like we're just going further and further away from you, Lord. We pray you just lead God and direct in all things. Just now we pray. Amen. Here we are. We're back in you know, Genesis, picking up here in Genesis chapter 39, and we're again looking at Joseph. Uh, kind of finished up in you know, chapter 37, finished up first looking at Joseph and how his brothers sold him. To the Ishmaelites there and chapter 39 kind of starts out reminding us of that because chapter 38 was kind of a chapter where we looked at a little bit of the life of Judah and and an incident that happened in his life and so we're back now focusing totally on Joseph and we'll be focusing on Joseph for the remaining through the remaining chapters which is through chapter 50 the 50 chapters in, in Genesis through the, the coming weeks and so and just thinking about Joseph and the thoughts about Joseph, and again, the title of the lesson this week is Joseph is Protected in Egypt, and it's coming out of chapters 39 and chapter, chapter number 40. Uh, as we think about Joseph, he is one of the most perfect types of Christ in the Bible. We, there's Some have said as, in well, like a hundred or more ways in which he is a type of Christ. There's definitely, if you can't look at his life and see some foreshadowing and see how that it points us you know, and makes us think about things that happened to Christ in his life and ministry, and you, you can't help but see the parallels if you do a little studying into it. And another thing I was thinking about Joseph is out of, you know, the many people we see in the Bible, there are two that there's never anything bad said about, and one of those is Joseph and the other is Daniel. So, you know, and of course, you know, nothing can be bad said about Christ, but we're talking about men here, not the Son of God in being born into human flesh here because of course he was the son of God and he was perfect but and there's nothing bad to be said about the Lord Jesus Christ but you know as far as true men nothing is ever bad said about Joseph or Daniel in the in the scripture and so let's let's pick up here in verse number one of chapter number 39 it says and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh captain of guard an Egyptian bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites which had brought him down thither and so this kind of just recaps what happened back in chapter 37, how that he was brought down to Egypt. He was sold here under Potiphar by the Ishmaelites that his brothers sold him to back there for 20 pieces of, of silver back in, in the land of Canaan. And so here we see that Potiphar, he was an officer of Pharaoh's. He was a captain of the guards. So he had a high exalted position. So, And that's important. You know, Joseph is not just sold to anybody. He's not sold to some farmer who's looking for farm labor. He's not working, sold to some, 
you know, building contractor looking for manual labor, he's sold to Potiphar, and so he becomes a household servant, and he functions in a household role, and being that, Pharaoh, that Potiphar is an officer of Pharaoh's, he, Joseph is introduced to the way that the government and everything functions there in Egypt and, and the norms and of the society there, and so he becomes knowledgeable of those things, and that will be important later and important instruction and help for him later when we see that he does get promoted to be over the entire nation of Egypt, second to Pharaoh only. Of course, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves in here, but we can't help but look forward to those things and see how that the things that are happening to Joseph in these two chapters ultimately lead to Joseph being to that promoted state later. And so it says in verse number two, and Joseph was, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass from time from the time that he was made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So we see down through verses 2 through 6 here, it kind of describes what happens to Joseph in Potiphar's house. He, it's obvious, It becomes clear, number one, the first key phrase here is the Lord was with Joseph. And you'll see that phrase repeated through this chapter. The Lord was with Joseph. And even into the next chapter, the Lord was with Joseph. And that's an important factor. You know, Joseph knew the Lord. He was aware of the Lord. He served the Lord. And therefore, the Lord was with him. And we see that he prospers. He prospers Joseph here. And Joseph is eventually advanced to being the overseer all over all of Potiphar's house because Potiphar realizes that the Lord, even though Potiphar was a you know, a pagan worshiping Egyptian, the Egyptians had thousands of gods that they worshiped, but yet he recognized the fact that Joseph, in honoring his God, and I'm, they believe here that Joseph was very clear that he was of the descendants of Abraham, that he was a servant of the Most High God, the true and living God, whether the Egyptians wanted to believe in the true and living God or not, Joseph made it clear that he was different from them. He did not conform to the world. Here, you remember Egypt in the Bible is always a type of the world. So here is Joseph, a, a servant of God in the world, but yet he does not conform to the world. He keeps his unique identity as a servant and a chosen one of God and one of God's chosen people, he keeps that separate identity and doesn't you know, depart from that. And that would be good instruction for us all to remember that, yes, we have to live in this world, but we don't have to live like the world. We don't have to partake of the things of the world. We can keep our Christian identity and our true, keep ourselves true to God, even though we are having to live in a De, de, you know, a desperate, wicked, evil world in perilous times. We can still be unique and show our Christianity and have it where people know that we're a Christian. Not that we have to tell them that we're a Christian, but they can see it through us. So I believe Joseph lived differently even though he was in, the, in his master's house and the pressure was obviously there to conform to the Egyptian ways and though he learned a lot about the Egyptian ways and was able to oversee Potter's first house successfully, it was Still, he kept his unique identity, and we'll see that as we go on down through here. But it says, you know, you know Joseph then you know, finds sight. His master realizes that the Lord's prospering him, and the sight finds grace, therefore, in Potiphar's sight in verse 4, and he can, you know, makes him complete overseer of all of his house. He doesn't even know what he's got. Except he just knows that he has food to eat. And so Joseph has got complete control. Only person superior in Potiphar's house to, Pot to Joseph was Potiphar himself. As far as you know, the business dealings and the you know, commerce of the house here. And you know, a key thing here in verse number 6 is Joseph was, a goodly and was goodly and well favored. So Joseph was you know, a good person and he was well favored. People liked him. 
And you know, a lot of times people will hate you because you're a Christian, but if you're truly acting Christ-like, they may hate you because of your stand against certain sins, but they can't fault you as being a hypocrite or being something that you, you know, you know, that you're not. You know, so you know, it's always important to live our lives correctly and rightly in the eyes of God. In verse number seven, of course, things we find out that even though things are going pretty well for Joseph in Potiphar's house, things quickly change. In verse number seven, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath commanded all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Now then can, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So Potiphar's wife gets to lusting after Joseph. You know, she sees that he's a good-looking young man and she decides that she wants to lie with him, to have relations with him, and Joseph refuses. Joseph does the right thing here. She comes to him trying to seduce him and he says, no, you know, you are my master's wife. You know, he doesn't know what's in, he doesn't even know what he has, but he says, I'm, and I'm overseer of all that and he's committed everything to me, but the one thing he's kept back from me is you. And it would be wrong for me to betray my master's trust and to do this with you. And of course, her being, you know, Potiphar's wife and being, you know, and Joseph being the servant, she probably thought as Joseph being the servant that he, she should obey him in whatever order that she gave to him, which would include him lying with her in this carnal, sinful, lustful way here. And, and that was not right. And, you know, he says here, he even says, you know, number one, you know, he's, he's committed everything to my hat to me. In verse number nine, except you, he's kept you from me. And he said, it would be a God in the eye, sin in the eyes of God for me to do this wickedness. So Joseph does the right thing here. He refuses the advances of his master's wife. Now, some have suggested that maybe Potiphar being a officer in Pharaoh's court and everything that oftentimes these men were made into eunuchs and therefore him and his wife couldn't really have relation marital relations and therefore she was common it was common for her to seek this satisfaction through servants or whatever means she could find it now we can't prove that and that may may or may not be the case but whatever the case is you know the Egyptians didn't hold the same sanctity to marriage that you know we should hold that God would have us to hold and even, our, even in our nation today we're not holding the sanctity of marriage where it should be in God's eyes but you know it's quite possible that it was not uncommon for Potiphar's wife to have relations with her with the servants or with anybody she chose to have relations with and and so and I kind of I think we can kind of see a little bit of that here as we go on through that it says in verse number 10, And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Now, she just didn't give up here in verse 10. She kept pressing, she kept trying, she kept trying to convince Joseph to, to lie with her. And so that's the way sin works. Satan never just throws a temptation in a person's face one time. He's going to continually work away at you, kind of erode your resistance and say, yeah, it, you know, why not, you know, who would ever know, you know, and it, it can become to the point to where you just give in just because you're tired of the pressure, but if, you know, we've got one that's more powerful, we have the Holy Spirit, if you're truly saved and you've got the indwelling Holy Spirit, you've got one that's far more powerful than Satan and his demons, and so you can easily overcome that temptation if you'll just allow the Holy Spirit to have rule and reign in your life. And here we see that Joseph never succumbs to this temptation, even though she continually hounds at him probably day after day after day. Every opportunity she has, she's probably continuing to try to get him to do this evil deed with her, and he refuses to do it. Verse number 11 says, It came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men in the house therewith then. And she called him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And so here, one day, 
and I believe here she's probably planned this out. He, Joseph comes into the house to go about the normal business that he would go about every day and she's probably sent all the other servants out of the house so she would be totally alone with Joseph and so she takes hold of him and tries to force him to do this deed, to, to lie with her here. And we see that, you know, again, Joseph and his, you know, is smart enough here. He just, you know, she's got a hold of his garment, but she, he just gets it. He just leaves his garment behind and runs and gets away. And that's the best thing we can do when temptation comes our way is flee it and get away from it. Paul admonished Timothy to flee youthful lusts. And so we need to flee the lust of this flesh and the, the pride of life and the lust of thy. We need to flee those things, get away from those things and, and you know, you know, get away from the very appearance of evil. We don't need to have anything to do with it. And that's exactly what Joseph did. But unfortunately, the outcome still doesn't come out as like he would like to see, like you would you hope it would. You know, even though he's done the right thing, he's, there's going to be consequences for it. Verse 13, It came to pass when she saw that he had left his garments in her hand and he was fled forth, that she cried unto the men of this, her house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. So now that she's got his garment and she didn't get what she wanted out of him, hasn't been able to get what she wanted out of him up to this point. She thinks, well, I'll just get rid of him altogether. She says, okay, I'm going to come up with this story. So she calls the men, the men servants of the house in there and she says, hey, look here, that, that Hebrew. And so this is why I say Joseph kept a very unique identity. He did not conform to the Egyptian way. He asserted the fact that he was a descendant of Abraham. He was a Hebrew. He was of the land of Canaan. That's where he belonged. That's where he should have been. And he asserted that fact, I'm sure, oftentimes and made it clear that he was not going to conform to the ways of the Egyptians. And so he was unique in the fact that she calls him a Hebrew. And so she says, he's came in here, he's came in to mock me, he's came in here, you know, she basically says he came in here to rape her. And that, you know, when she cried out that he fled and left his garment behind. And of course, you know, we know that's a lie. But, you know... She holds on to the garment to use as evidence and she's convinced all these other servants that that's what happened and they probably, they probably knew better. They probably knew that Joseph was a goodly man and that he wouldn't have done this thing. But they probably, as we often see like in the, you know, over in Daniel, you know, how Daniel's envied against by the magicians and the Chaldeans and everything and the, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego likewise, they wanted to destroy them because they didn't like him getting elevated to high positions of power. They didn't like that Joseph had got elevated to a position over them. So they probably like, yeah, let's get let's 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 just go along with this to get rid of him and get him out of our way. And so verse 17 says, and so she held up the garment till the Lord came home. Verse 16, verse 17, and she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought un, brought. Un, brought unto us, came unto me to mock me. And it came to pass that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard these words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Now here we see that she tells the story to Potiphar when he comes home and and explains it, the whole thing, says, you know, basically you brought this Hebrew in here, he came in here to mock me, to rape me, to take advantage of me, and, you know, when I screamed out, he ran away and left his garment behind, and we noticed that, you know, it uh, angers Potiphar, and I'm not so sure that, you know, Potiphar's so angry that supposedly that Joseph tried to take advantage of his wife, or if he's angry because he knows deep down that Joseph really didn't do this, but now he has to do something. He has to, you know, look like he's defending his wife and taking care of her. He probably knew the nature of his wife. She probably knew she was prone to this kind of activity. And, you know, his wrath is kindled, but notice what he does. I mean, he probably, you know, if his wrath was truly kindled and he truly believed that Joseph was guilty of this event, 
Now this, this incident, he probably would have just took Joseph out and killed him or thrown him into you know, a hard labor prison. But notice in verse 20, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. So he doesn't take him and put him in a, in a you know, work camp or some really rough prison. He takes and puts him in the king's prison, where the kings, those who offended the king, are placed. So this is not the worst of the worst prison. This is not the worst of the worst punishment you can have. This is actually, you know, probably a kind of, this is like the upper class prison. This is a prison where, and, you know, Joseph being a servant should not have been sent to this prison. And so clearly, I believe Potiphar realized that this was not truly what it was. And, you know, you say, well, now Joseph's getting cast in a prison. And you say, well, where's God with him? Why has God allowed us to do it? And it's all part of God's plan. In the life of Joseph, we truly see how so many bad things happen to Joseph, but it truly is working out according to God's plan that God can later use Joseph to save his family. And as we go through these lessons, we'll see that. It says in verse number 21, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison, prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. But notice verse 21. Again, the Lord was with Joseph. No matter where Joseph was, whether it's serving in the house of Potiphar, whether it's cast into the king's prison here, the Lord is with him. And the Lord promises that those that are truly his, that he will never leave them or forsake them. He'll go with them to the ends of the world. And so no matter where you're at, the highest mountaintop, the lowest valley, the Lord is with you if you're one of his. And he showed mercy unto Joseph. And he gives him favor in the sight of the prison keeper. So basically the warden of the prison here realizes Joseph's a pretty smart man and he's got some skills about him. And he quickly, basically puts Joseph, even though he's a prisoner, as the assistant warden. He's looking out after all the other prisoners that are in prison to where the prison guard, based the prison real warden here, the keeper of the prison, he hasn't got anything to do but let Joseph do the work. And so we see how the Lord continues to prosper him. Well, that brings us down to chapter number 40. And so we're not going to cover every verse in here, but we're just going to you know, hit a few verses and then cover, just talk about what happens in this chapter. It says in verse 40, chapter, chapter 40 and verse 1, it says, It came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt, and Pharaoh was wrought against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward of the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. So here we've got these people in prison. We got the you know, we got the chief butler and the chief baker. They've done something to offend the king, and the king's tossed them into the king's prison. And Joseph is placed over top of them. Now, some have you know thought and suggested, you know, studying this, that probably there was some kind of an attempt on Pharaoh's life in trying to poison him through food or drink, and so the chief cap the chief butler here, the chief cupbearer, the butler actually is comes from is translated from word it means cupbearer, it's the same word used concerning Nehemiah being a cupbearer of the king in the in the book of Nehemiah. And here the bake the chief baker, so he's the chief over the the cooking of meals and stuff for Pharaoh. And you know part of their important job was to keep the Pharaoh safe from any attempts at his life. And so obviously there could have been an attempt on Pharaoh's life, and so he doesn't know which one's guilty, which one's, you know, responsible at this point, so he throws them both into prison until the whole deal can be sorted out. So they're in prison for a while. Joseph is placed over these to look after these men, to take care of them, to see to them. And in verse 5, they both dream a dream. And in verse 6, Joseph notices the next morning that they're sad, so he inquires about them, and we'll read verse 7. It says, And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sad today? And so he notices their countenance is different. And he notices that some, they're, they're saddened about something. And so he says, You know, what is it you're sad about? And verse 8 says, And they said to him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them, I pray you. 
And so here they say, we had the dream, but there's nobody to interpret them. And of course, if they would have had these dreams and they were not in prison, they would have went straight to the magicians and the interpreters of dreams and stuff that they were in the king's court and had them to try to interpret the dream. But they don't have anybody down in prison. And those guys are not going to come down here to the prison to interpret prisoners' dreams. And so they're, they're downhearted about it. They don't understand what the dreams mean. And Joseph says to him, you know, again, being a good witness to him, says, does not interpretations belong to God. So tell me what the dreams, tell me your dreams, and you know, I'll interpret them through the help of the Lord for you. So the next few verses, the chief butler starts out, and he tells the, Joseph his dream, says, you know, behold, there were three vine, three, three branches on a vine, a grapevine, and said they bloomed, and they, they grew into clusters, and I took those clusters from the vines, and I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and gave the cup to Pharaoh, and he drank. And so he says, you know, so Joseph gives him the interpretation down here and says, you know, it's the three vine, the three branches represent three days, and three days you're going to be restored back to your position as the chief butler, the chief cupbearer. But verse 14, Joseph says here, But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, and I pray thee unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have been I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. So he says, hey, I've been cast into prison. I'm not from this land. I don't belong here. I did nothing to deserve to be cast into prison. So please, when you're restored to your position, please speak unto Pharaoh to me. So he's seeking an audience to let to, for Pharaoh that he might get released from prison, probably thinking that he'll be able to go back home to his father and his brethren there in the land of Canaan. Well, when the chief baker hears the good interpretation concerning the chief butler's dream, he said, tells Joseph his dream, says, I got three baskets on my head in my dream, and they got all kinds of matter or baked goods in them, and the birds come in there and eat all the baked goods out of them. Well, Joseph tells him, says, well, again, the baskets represent three days, and in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift you up out of the prison, he's going to hang you on a tree, and the birds are going to eat your flesh. Not a good interpretation. You know, so I'm sure this did not make the chief baker happy. And so we see that, these de that the interpretations that Joseph had do come true. In verse 20 it says, And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. But notice verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but it, but forgot him. How easy it is for us sometimes to forget those that have been a help to us along the way, just like this butler did. He's restored back to position. He's all excited about that, and he totally forgets about the man who told him that this was going to happen. And we find out in the next chapter that it's a full two years before he finally remembers about Joseph interpreting his dream. And so that's kind of where we'll leave off for today. I hope you got something out of it. I hope it's a blessing and help to you. And we, you know, studying Joseph is always a good study. Again, noticing all the similarities and, and types and how he typifies Christ. And just pray, I hope you get something out of it. And thank you for watching.